good to have each of you here. Welcome to CHM. This is fun to be back after the pandemic. Do you know it's been, this is only our second event after 700, more than 700 days that the museum was closed. And so we're really thrilled to have each of you here uh, for this event in person as well as live stream our audience across um, the United States. So more than ever, we've seen after living with our, our lives uh, on Zoom this past couple years, we've seen how technology can both uh, benefit as well as um, harm our lives and our communities and, our, and the world. And we're really committed to the museum um, mission, which is to decode technology, its computing past, its digital present, and its future. We take seriously the responsibility and opportunity to help advance the conversations that really help us think about how technology can be harnessed to shape a better future for all of us. Um, and along the way, we also want to have some fun. And tonight is a great example of that. At the heart of the story of the promise and perils of technology is AI and what's happening today. And for more than 80 years, humans and machines have been competing, whether it's chess or Go or poker or even Jeopardy. And um, the latest battlefields have been the hugely popular areas of esports, including Dota 2, which we'll be talking about today. And so a few years ago, a passionate team at OpenAI uh, took on the challenge in the race to develop an AI bot that could um, be capable of taking on the world champions, the human champions in Dota 2. And so that's the story that we're going to explore today, not only what happened, who was there, but what are some of the implications for all of us as we think about AI and humans. So here's how the evening is going to unfold. First, we're going to... Uh, have a chance to meet our two um, speakers, incredible technologists who have been at the heart of the story. And then we're gonna screen the film, full 90 minutes of the documentary, and then we'll bring them back on stage to have uh, interactive Q&A. Uh, Jenny Aitley, who is an entrepreneur, journalist, and also executive producer of the film, was originally gonna be here as the moderator. Unfortunately, she had a, a serious um, sports injury recently and so was unable to join us. Um, so Jenny, we're missing you and we're wishing you the best and speedy recovery. So I'm stepping in tonight uh, as the moderator. Uh, following the CHM tradition, I'll introduce our two speakers with five numbers. First, David Fari. So 300,000 words of content are written for a single live action role playing game. 0.1 billion, the estimated uh, number of OpenAI 5 versus an OpenAI 5 Dota 2 matches during training. 5 billion, the estimated number of human versus human Dota 2 matches ever played. 150 million, the parameters in the OpenAI 5, and 175 billion parameters in GPT-3. So you can tell he's a technologist, technologist. Please join me in welcoming David. He's a technical lead at OpenAI. So glad to have you here, David. Thank you. Next, Susan Jong. And here are her five numbers. 50, the amount of dollars for her first check. It was the prize money she won uh, playing piano as a seven-year-old. 11, the age when she first started programming. Nine, the number of different full-time jobs she's had since college. More than 100 million, the cumulative amount of compute budgets she's managed in the last 10 years. And one, the number of 14ers summited as a solo hiker, Mount Whitney. So let's give a warm welcome to Susan. So glad you're here. Uh, Susan's an uh, AI uh, researcher at Meta. So that's what she, where she is now. So David and Susan, it's great to have you here. And uh, we're really excited to learn more about the film. But before we get started, um, I have a question for you that I think will be interesting for all of us here in the audience. And that is, so you've lived the experience. You've seen the documentary. What one question, or what's a question that we might have as audience members as we watch the documentary? David, why don't we start with you? Um, yeah, so this is a documentary about playing games and having fun. Uh, but as you mentioned in the intro, you know, we in this field at OpenAI are ultimately shooting for making these systems that can really help humanity in all sorts of ways, um, you know, ways that are way more powerful than we have now. And so you know, I think it's interesting that as you watch this, these systems are a small step towards things that could you know, be an assistant to a doctor or do novel research on their own into cures to diseases and really solve important problems. And there's a long way to go. but 
I think in these steps, there's already you can already see enough here to start thinking about, like, at least naming the things that's missing and the steps we need to take to get to where we're trying to go. Great. Good area of focus. Susan, how about you? I have a very simple question. It's the same question I had while I was working on this project, and it's, is this actually a real job? <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun, definitely, but you know what we were doing, I think most of us had no idea what, where it would go, so that was part of the journey. Yeah. Great. Okay, with that, we're going to uh, ask David and Susan to join all of us in the audience. We're going to get to watch the full film, and then we'll be back up here for a discussion. Let's roll the film. Thanks. last day of the international. There are still matches coming up today. Between the last matches, we have the costume competition, and now we have a little bit of a special treat before we get into that lower bracket match. A special treat indeed, Sean. It's time for a battle like no other. You've had five players in these booths, five versus five. How about we do one versus one like you've never seen before. It is my absolute pleasure and please raise the decibel levels, raise the roof as we introduce your first champion. this 1v1. Who will stand the test of Dendi on this main stage? Strap yourselves in, ladies and gentlemen, because it's time to meet Dendi's opponent. What? Oh, man. It really doesn't make sense. Dendi, can you comprehend the idea of a bot being better than you? Come on, yep. it's just a He's bot. He's in-game, it's just a bot. I am joined, let's get the introductions out of the way. I'm joined by two guys from OpenAI, a 10-man team who have been working on this. We have Greg and Jakob. Does Dendi have a chance versus your AI? There's always a chance. <laughs> okay. We'll be talking more about how on earth this has come to be, but first, I want to get this first game underway. Two kills or a tower, Dendi? That's not hard, right? Sounds uh, super easy against a bot, right? Scary. He's dominating. Are you scared of a bot here? Oh! Did it just fake him out? It definitely does that. Sneaky bot. He's going in. I'm dead. Oh! First to two kills. Oh, no, 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 no. The 
Hands are shaking, Dendi. Are you giving up? Yep. He's too strong. Guys, let's give a round of applause. Open AI have beaten the world's best Dota players with this machine. So let me tell you the next step in the project. Next step in the project is 5v5. So just wait for next year's international. Now we'll see how that one's gonna go down. One more time, open AI, Dendi, and a 1v1. I remember when I read Alan Turing's 1950 paper on the Turing test. He said that, imagine if we could have a machine that would not be programmed with a solution that, that we really understand, but it would learn its own solution. And the idea that you could actually have a machine that would be able to solve problems that I couldn't understand, that became the thing that I wanted to work on. I always wanted to work on AI um, and push the limits of what computers can do. Around the release of AlphaGo, I realized that deep learning is actually a technology that might go very far. Before coming to OpenAI, I was building large distributed data processing systems. And before that, I was working as a data scientist. And before that, I was working uh, in finance, actually, at Morgan Stanley. So been a sort of circuitous route coming here. <laughs> there was actually a mobile developer working on iPhone apps. And I wanted to work on something new and exciting. I want to feel like I'm working in the Wild West. In school, I actually did a PhD in theoretical particle physics. And then I moved to software engineering. And then I felt like I wanted to go a little more towards research, uh, so I came here to do AI research. Before I joined OpenAI, I was making a living out of playing poker professionally. I played games professionally, made a living out of winning programming contests. OpenAI is my first real job. AI is everywhere around us. Almost every tech platform that we use today uses some kind of artificial intelligence. Netflix uses AI. Same thing with YouTube. Siri, Alexa, all voice assistants. Google and Facebook also use AI. For starters, we should talk about what artificial intelligence is. Uh, there's this big question in the field about what is artificial intelligence. I would define artificial intelligence as trying to get computers to do things that humans are currently better at. Things like image recognition, natural language processing, these are areas where humans are far better than computers. Almost everything that we currently understand to be artificial intelligence is a very small subdivision of the field called machine learning. A classic example is cat versus dog photos. So you can show the computer tons of cat photos and say, like, these are cats and then show them a ton of dog photos and say these are dogs. And then the computer uses statistics to figure out, okay, when the pixels are this way, I now know that this must be a cat. And when the pixels are the other way, it must be a dog. We open our phone, it's face recognition. That's machine learning. Our mail gets sorted with visual recognition powered by machine learning. But these are examples of machine learning pattern recognition. And there's this whole other kind of machine learning where it's not just about pattern recognition, it's about learning to achieve goals. For example, learning to win a game. Oh, this is it. Right. There's this really long history of using games as a benchmark for AI. The reason for it is very simple. At the end of the day, AI progress is really driven by having hard problems to solve. I don't really know how to play chess, but I know the rules and it's enough for me to know the rules, to write a program that can play chess, and in fact can play chess better than I can play it. And that to me is just so fascinating that I can write a piece of code that then outsmarts me. And I think, you know, of course, chess is exciting, but that opens up many opportunities for, well, what else can we write code for that then all of a sudden can solve the problem better than we can? Deep Blue beat the world champion back in the 90s. AlphaGo pushed the limits of AI 
to a point where they'd never been before. It is possible to be humans just with plain old like planning and just tree search, which is basically like all the possibilities, okay, and then all the possibilities there, okay, and then all the possibilities there, and you just find the best path. For a game like chess, people usually measure what's called the branching factor, which is at each turn, how many moves are there that are valid. And in chess, the number works out to something like a couple dozen, you know, maybe 10 or 20 or 30, something around there. For something like Dota, the number starts to look more like 1,000, 10,000. And what it really means is that the neural network can't be looking through all of the possibilities. Instead, the neural network has to have something that looks a lot more like human intuition. It looks at the state of the world and it just figures out what to do from there. Whoever wants to. Okay. But I... A good part of my research is on solving imperfect information games. It's not really about the recreational games themselves. It's about building techniques that can deal with imperfect information, deception, and so on. What I should do depends on what the other players do and vice versa. They know things that I don't know and I know things that they don't know. Working on poker AIs, for example, it's not about developing an AI that can play poker, it's about situations that involve hidden information. Hidden information is ubiquitous in the real world. You see it in negotiations, you see it even in self-driving cars. You might not see the car in front of you or know what the goal is of the car next to you if they're trying to merge into your lane or not. AI is in this place right now where we have all these really cool tools and it's great at solving these small baby environments, Atari games like Pong and Pac-Man. And so we're trying to see how much our current tools can do on things where you have real-time actions to make choices quickly, with imperfect information. All these things to bring it closer to what you might think an AI interaction in the real world would have to deal with. Dota is a competitive team-based video game where you have two teams with five aside. You both have a base that you're defending. Dota stands for Defense of the Ancients. You both have an Ancient, and the aim of the game is to destroy the enemy's Ancient. Dota, the way I like to put it, is a mixture between chess and basketball. It's a fast-paced strategy game, but it's also a team sport. Dota is super hard to learn, and even harder to master. It's one of the most complex games out there, maybe the most complex game. It's a square map. The ancients are in the bottom left corner and the top right corner. You have a lane straight down the middle, two lanes that go across the edge of the square. The map is always the same. There's one map in Dota 2. It sounds boring, but it isn't because there's a lot of other variables. There are almost 120 different heroes, each with unique abilities. Every game is unique. Every game has different strategies being implemented. There are all kinds of different movements that you have to make in a split second. You have to react fast. You have to understand how to communicate and work with your team. And of course, whilst the game's going on, your heroes, they level up, they gain new abilities, the abilities get stronger. You gain gold that you use to buy items, which improve your abilities. It's a constant ball of micro decisions that are made like at every step of the game and those decisions are made not by one person but by 10 people. Every decision has an impact and a large portion of that is assumptions. When the game starts, you don't see half the map and that goes for both teams. We have a high ground and a low ground. If you have a high ground and you're looking down, you can look at a guy who can't look back at you. There's also a day and night cycle in Dota and certain heroes have different vision during day and night. Very complex system that just keeps adding more and more layers. I mean, I'm sitting here, it's been 10 years of me like dedicating my life to the game and really pushing it as hard as I can. And I'm still learning on a daily basis, like truly learning about the game, the mechanics, all of it. But once you do start learning the game, you realize how beautifully complex the game is and how many opportunities there are to be able to create your own story within the game, to show your own style, show your own personality in a way. So when I first played OpenAI, I was a little bit shocked, I would say, in a way. He would use any small advantage that he would uh, get on you, he will not, not lose it. Like a human can miss some advantage parts, 
in special microseconds, but bot will not. 1v1 mid-match is very mechanical. There are a lot of fine-tuned tactics, but an AI, of course, with its perfect reaction timings, would do very well in that matchup. Five on five, that's a lot different. The goal is always to solve this very hard game that seemed kind of like uh, right at the edge of what might be possible. Maybe it's a little impossible or it would, it would take a little while to, to get it to work. And so the goal is always 5v5. Um, Greg kind of like uh, laid down the gauntlet a little at the end where he was like, we'll, we'll see you next year. Like, we'll be back with 5v5 next year. No one from the team knew it's going to happen. So when we heard that, everyone was looking at each other like, we were screwed. <laughs> yeah, so no idea. And we're all in the back being like, oh boy, we haven't really thought about it. It's, it's way more complicated problem. My thought was that this is very ambitious. <laughs> it was definitely bold. I definitely thought it was um, too much. I didn't think we'd have anything to present within a year. I've been playing Dota for more than half my life now. And the game is so complex. There are so many nuances and possible strategies, possible things you can do. No matter how perfect their reaction timing would be, I couldn't see how they could actually take on a group of five players. That seems something that is, okay, maybe a few years down the line. I mean, you guys are way ahead of yourselves. Like, come on, like, you know, like, just let's be realistic for a second. That's not happening. Each year's advantage is given by the, that guy's reward plus V2 minus V1 or whatever it is. And your combined value function went from V1 to V2. What OpenAI 5 is, is this massive reinforcement learning project. Reinforcement learning is basically just trial and error and really good memory. Can you imagine yourself if you were trying to navigate San Francisco and you were driving and every day you're like, man, five o'clock, it gets really bad around this time. I should not be driving. And you'd remember that. And that's basically what the bot is doing. We give it two broad types of things. First of all, the game is designed to be played by humans. And so we have to translate that into an array of numbers. The unit's health and their positions and which way they're facing and what abilities they have. And then there's a second half of that, which is all the actions you can take are designed to be played by a human, where you click over here, you enter this keyboard. And we again have to translate those into numbers the model can produce. Because neural networks just take a bunch of numbers and produce another bunch of numbers. When you look at a game of Dota, even if you've never played before, you see trees, you see heroes, you see creeps, there are towers that hit things. I mean, the bot doesn't know any of that, right? Like, it cannot differentiate between a tower and a creep and a hero. Like, it's all just some random number to it. It's completely blind in some sense. What's interesting about the AI is it learns in a very different way than humans. Like a human can go from having zero knowledge about the game to decent with just reading things or watching things or trying to replicate what you see other people do. The bot doesn't really get exposed to any of that. So at first it just seems like they're moving around kind of randomly. They don't make good decisions because they don't have anything to replicate off of. Keep in mind that when humans learn to play these games, we have like all these things we already know about the world, like all these things about like how space and time works, what it means to be to the left of something, right? Our agent needs to understand all of those elemental concepts from scratch. Reinforcement learning is this idea that you can kind of reward good behavior over time, and the AI can become better at performing that good behavior. Imagine you're training a pet, and you want him to like learn to sit or do some other tricks. You're not gonna go literally move every single muscle on, on your dog. You tell him to sit, and then if he kind of moves in a vaguely city direction, you give him a treat. Over time, it learns that when you say sit, it should drop its butt or it should put its paws in a particular way. And it figures kind of all this out, trying to optimize for like that reward that you're giving it. And so, for example, they get some gold and they get a reward, and they're like, oh, that was great, let me try and get more gold. Or they do some damage and they get a reward. And so this kind of like leads them towards the ultimate goal of winning the game. But there's always the danger that if there's too many things to randomly explore through trial and error, you just might take forever and not really see anything. For example, you give it like a very, very narrow bridge and then there's like a goal at the end of it. It will just like keep falling all the time if it's like walking randomly on this bridge, right? Just going to learn like, oh, every time I go to this bridge, I fall off and die. If you vary the length of this bridge now, that's a different story. Sometimes the bridge is going to be small, and sometimes the agent is going to have 10% chance just random walk to like get to the end. 
and it's gonna be like, oh, gold, like I should try it. Dota is a very complicated game. It has lots of features, lots of things you can do that aren't core to the game, but they're actually important to the strategy. So like any big software engineering project, we started with the smallest bit that would work. We'll take out some of the items that are more confusing, take out the Roshan monster in the middle of the map, take out all the heroes except for five of them, so just have the fixed set of five heroes that play against each other. And we started with that. And then we, over time, sort of gradually add this bit back in, add that bit back in. All the subtlety of the game, as seen by humans, happens when you add those features in. I think similar to how you wouldn't want to play Go on a minified board, you want to play the real Go game. We want to know that we can actually fulfill the, the real challenge. The benchmark event was this interesting chance to play against a bunch of players that had not played together as a team, but who were each known for having been either former professional, semi-professional, or really strong casters. And we would be playing full games of Dota in front of Twitch and a live audience and uh, a bunch of players that know a lot about the game and could point out obvious flaws. I remember I was pretty nervous because I didn't want to lose. There was a good amount of people there, and they're all hoping you win. I mean, I'd hope they thought we'd win, because I felt like we were the underdogs going in. Hey, Brooke. What? When do you need to know uh, if we're taking first pick or all that jazz by? As soon as possible. Because we would like to see, hi, Chrissy. Hey. We would like to see the bot play the audience game one. Can we tell you after that? We're not watching that game. We're not watching that game? No. Why not? Because then you'll know what to do. That's the entire point. <laughs> We are getting ready for the first of three games of excitement between these two teams, OpenAI and, of course, the humans. It looks like we do actually have the draft beginning. As a bit of an update, the OpenAI will pick heroes in response regarding what the humans are picking. The benchmark event was also a chance for us to show what drafting looked like. Just before the benchmark, we had increased from just five to a pool of 18 heroes at that point. The richness of the game that you see in, in professional play is this kind of rock, paper, scissors, or this clever adjoining of like different characters. Before every game, teams take turn to pick and ban heroes from the hero pool. That's an incredibly important part of the game because certain heroes will be very, very strong alongside another hero, and also obviously very strong against a certain hero. Humans are opening with an Earthshaker. OpenAI has been picking that a lot today in terms of all the drafts that I've seen. Someone else on our team had the idea to use the model's perception of whether or not it was going to win a game on the first minute to decide whether or not a team was good. Uh, look at that. The, the, the percentage has just gone up in milliseconds, 80, 90, 95. He changed his mind three times in a fraction of a second. <laughs> That's like, a lot of confidence from OpenAI, but here we go. This is going to be fun indeed. Crystal Maiden's in trouble. Oh, another dive in, another hex and another kill. Second one there for OpenAI on this top lane. Paul gets the Fisher out. He does get healed up. We're going to see the rest of the team continue to try and fight. Blitz turns for the raises. The Assassinate coming through with the Blast. The bounces. It's enough. That's going to be the SF gone. The humans, they're already down two heroes here. Boom trying to get to the center. He still has the Reaper side available. Lays it down to Blitz. Will get the kill, but he still ends up falling. His open AI will come out on top, but a very, very close team fight there between the two sides. What about the win probability? I was going to say, have they sort of lost their confidence? No, it's actually gone up. It's all right, we're struggling a little bit. We'll put, we're going to win 98% chance. Bogged, he's getting trapped in there. Trap, open no. AI, trapping the humans, taking down three of them. I think it was halfway through the first game, and we were winning. It was almost like magical. It was like, this thing, it's working, you know? These guys were really, really good, and we were beating them. It's a 5k advantage, 24 to 4 now. They've managed to find Malini. Fog yeah. desperately wanting this sniper, but open AI, they juke him out. Turn around, he's ready to turn and punch back as Fog Willful can't get the Fisher out. Open AI laughs in his face. Three wave is dead, so they're going to have to take the tower. Fog tries to but he hits to the hex! He instantly gets hex there by the line. He will get oh, the Echo Sam out. As four dead, they'll look for the fifth as OpenAI wipe them. GG will be called 21 minutes in. OpenAI will take game one. I thought 
up once. He's uh, really bad on that. The speed at which OpenAI plays that is just so quick. Normally in Dota, we almost have like a reset time. Like once one action occurs, there's like a period where you have some time, at least a little bit to think. But OpenAI just it continuously assails you. When we first started thinking about show matches, we were trying to figure out ways in which we could make it more obvious what the bot was thinking. We started to make it more public what they thought their win probability was because that just seemed like the most straightforward way of like, do you feel like you're winning right now? Are things going well or are things going poorly? It became this thing that sort of seemed like it was taunting the humans, even though we were really just trying to surface the information about how the bots were playing. Game two of OpenAI versus Team Human here at this benchmark. As we see Blitz there trying to match OpenAI with their level of all chatting. What, as we what is check, it actually? Though? We can actually check the real stats. Oh, it's, and well, it's a 92. It's you know, a little better. conservative. You know, hold it back a little bit. This is 3% better than it was last game. All right, can they initiate the right way? Oh, this is really bad for Sniper here. Is he blocked in? Oh. This is a dead hero. Wow. Blitz. First but there thanks to Moon Meander set up with the Fisher. Hang on. Oh, oh jumps into the angle. Oh. Moon, the combo, the slam, oh. the two. They got them there. Team Human. The open AI dropping the 99% now upon Team Human. There's the jump, they'll try. Have they got enough damage there between the two of them? They have, and that's gonna be the Shaker gone. Blitz taken down as well. Everybody on OpenAI survives. OpenAI take four once again. GG is called, and game two will also go to OpenAI. It was kind of stunning, because we lost so fast. Everyone was murmuring, and I'm assuming they were talking shit about how badly we got stomped. I would, I, 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 I laugh at those guys, you know? They just got crushed in 20 minutes, how embarrassing. I really wanted to come in this one and win, but it was really cool and humbling to actually just get kind of crushed and dominated in the first two games, so. so. I was like really taken aback, like this is like really impressive that they managed to actually like, not just make a really good bot, but it owned me really hard. It was very different from playing against humans, just because of the fact that it felt like they could understand threats or the lack of threats and judge perfectly when to be able to just go and attack you. It was just fascinating when the AI would do something that a human player would never do. The way they played was very aggressive. It would have a fight that to us would maybe not look like a good fight. Obviously, the, you win a fight, it doesn't mean you win the game. You know, the, And the AI was, you know, it would take sometimes bad fights because it knew it was able to achieve something elsewhere or something off the back of it. It was the weirdest Dota match I've ever played, for sure. I would call it Dota in like the lightest sense. Um, maybe it's just me protecting my own ego since we got whooped so badly, but the, the game was very different. Definitely my first impression was, oh, you know, there's all these restrictions in place, there's a limited hero pool. That didn't really mirror what competitive Dota is. But ultimately, you kind of watch the game and then you realize like, Holy crap, these, the way they move and the way they're playing, like everything they, they were doing inside the game made sense. And a lot of it had never been seen before. They completely ran over the human team. I think that we sort of had an idea that the Dota community was interested. They were well aware that we weren't playing real Dota and were very happy to tell us about that. But for the most part, it was pretty positive because we were getting a lot further than people expected us to. And then we never had time to celebrate because we were still in crunch time for TI. <laughs> so no time for rest. I think time is really the enemy here. We have only limited time till TI, right? Like, right. right. Yeah, right? It's like the approaching, like every day, oh, we can have like Philip go up to the board and write like 32, and everybody's like, oh, <laughs> fuck, Philip, what are you doing? <laughs> Push TI back, and he's like, no, no, bring it closer. When we started this project, no one had any idea how we were supposed to solve it. We just knew that this was an important problem. If we could solve it, it would be a big deal, and that we'd have to do something no one had done before. Working on deep learning in general is very susceptible to bugs, because you are working with systems that are able to take any sort of data and usually make something useful out of it. So even if your data is corrupted or your learning algorithm isn't really like has some bugs, it's still likely that the model will 
be learning and it will be hard to tell whether it's learning poorly because the problem is hard or because you have some you have some errors in your pipeline the whole team was very excited about this evolutionary strategies algorithm an algorithm that is simpler than reinforcement learning but uh, the premise was that like hey, you can take this simple code and run it in parallel, run it on many computers, and the sheer scale of things will, will actually make it produce a really good results. Before, you know, switching to all these alternate approaches, we just wanted to check, well, just to be sure what happens when you actually, you know, run these algorithms on, on, on some significant number of, of CPUs. You know, Jakob Schmone did this really amazing thing of questioning all the conventional wisdom. I was trying to convince them to work on Dota on this game, and they said, let's try scaling up reinforcement learning. Initially, Greg was very skeptical, so he actually asked us to make sure that we don't devote more than half the time to that project. And so we, yeah, we actually sort of hid in a secluded part of the office for a week or two, started working on a distributed learning system we called Rapid to make running these experiments easier and, you know, maybe scale to like 10 machines or something. And, you know, that was the beginning of it. I think it's actually a really awesome story for how progress happens in this field. There's conventional wisdom, and Jakob Shimon asked the question of why. Why do we believe that? Has anyone ever tested it? And they just kept pushing and pushing us to larger scale. And that was pretty much our m mindset from the beginning, that we want to take this technology, we want to push it as far as we can. When it breaks, we'll have a problem to work on. It, it hasn't actually broken. We started out running on just a couple machines with 30 CPUs. Shortly after, we reached 1,000 CPUs and we actually started getting really good performance. Yeah, so the scale of our mission grew. And by the time we were using like 30,000 CPUs, we can actually tackle best human players in a game of 1v1. We were like, okay, so maybe if we use 10 times more, we'll actually be able to take on the full game. By the end of the project, we were using 300,000 CPUs and 2,000 of the latest graphic cards. We need a lot of computers to see a lot of different games. This is essentially what allows us to discover new strategies. So without scale, nothing works. And that's usually not a dimension that you see in other machine learning problems. The way that we train this system is through a very simple idea called self-play. Imagine if you are trying to learn to play tennis and you play against uh, Serena Williams. You're not gonna learn anything. Right, like you're just gonna, no matter what you try, even if it was a good idea, you're just gonna lose. And Serena's definitely not gonna learn anything from you. And so what's really important is that you have balance, right? That if you played against an exact copy of yourself and you tried things out and you came up with an innovation that was a slightly good idea, you'll actually see that turn into you getting more points. That's exactly how this system works. It plays against copies of itself and because it's just a computer system, we're able to replicate it many, many times off in the cloud. For our 5v5 bot, we're playing about 180 years worth of Dota gameplay every day. The origin of Dota really goes back to one individual and eventually a group of individuals' passion project. It was a custom game made inside the Warcraft 3 platform, which was a video game itself made by Blizzard that allowed users to create their own custom mini games. At that point, eSports, I would say, was just kind of starting its very quick upwards trajectory. It was growing at an exponential rate. Live streaming was becoming a huge thing with platforms like YouTube, Twitch TV, and Dota 1 was a small niche custom game inside another competitive video game that had a huge audience of its own. When the International first started, uh, it kind of became to be because Valve, the developer of Dota 2, wanted to make a really big splash with this new big game title. They brought in this tournament that had a prize pool of a million dollars, and back then that was unheard of. People actually thought it was a scam. The prize pool that players had been competing for at tournaments before the International was a fraction of that. They were competing for 10, 20, $50,000 at the most, so a $1 million tournament was just game-changing. It was a huge incentive for a lot of professional players who at the time were playing more for the love of the game. They were in college or high school and this was what they were doing on the side. And sure, maybe they got a trip to you know, Sweden. They were going to DreamHack or something like, oh, that's really cool. But it wasn't a career. 
Once that kind of money started coming around, people were able to sit down and look at it and go, okay, I can actually commit full time to being in esports. TI3, Valve introduced something called the Compendium. It's a mechanic within the game. And it basically gives the community a, a way to purchase stuff and make this, this makes the tournament community funded. And since then, it's, it's been continuously breaking the record with its own price pool and with its own size. I've been blessed enough to have been at every TI since the first one that I went to, which was TI3. And yeah, it, it just keeps getting bigger, man. It keeps getting bigger and bigger. And the big thing that changed over the year was adding that element of professionalism structure. So today you see teams, they have professional coaches, they have training staff, they have a support system around them to help their players compete at the highest level. All of these players, it's not like they just played their favorite video game, they were pretty good at it, showed up and started willing millions of dollars. No, these are people who very often have a background in traditional sports, who played basketball in high school or were on their football team. And what really drives them the most is competition. TI today is one of the biggest esports tournaments in the world. It is the most prize money any individual esports competitor can earn on a given day. It's always going to be a pinnacle of esports. Part of that is the money. You can't get away from the money. It's so much money. It's so much money. It is a huge celebration of what Dota is and has become. It's about celebrating the game. It's about giving back to the fans, the community, the ones who kind of grew the game to what it is. It features contributions from the community, from all the different people in different areas, commentators, producers, content creators. There's always seating for around sort of 17,000 people and it uh, always sells out regardless where it goes around the world. People will travel, the locals will come and the stadium will, will be absolutely packed. Okay, so what should we do? We're still trying to repro, right? And understand what's so going on. So, some of us should repro. I can try doing the necro necro fight. Usually, when you train a system like this, be it a bot to play a game or like a computer vision system that's like trying to figure out is that a cat, is that a dog, you figure out your data set for the problem and then you initialize a model like a neural net with random weights. Yep. He does have that thing. He does have a. You do this training process. You start with the behaving randomly, trains for a long time, and becomes very good. You're like, great, that was good. You take that, you, you play against humans, you do whatever you're going to do with it. And then you have some idea of how to make it better. You say, ah, this time we're going to change how this system works. We're going to add this feature. We're going to do something cooler and new. You start from the beginning, the random behavior, totally garbage play, and then it becomes better and better and better. And hopefully by the end, it gets even better than your previous one. At some point we decided, you know, like, the scale of this problem is so large and we have so little time. That if we were to do the train from scratch process, we think it would take maybe a month to get back to where we are now every single time. And so the approach that we adopted was, instead of training from scratch, we're just going to plan to keep this one experiment. We're going to start it in June. We're going to keep it running all the way through to the contest. We have our current best bot. We want to make some change that will hopefully make it better, maybe introduce a new part of the game or change something about how the model works. With each of these features, we've added it, we have to do a surgery. I think we coined this word surgery, although I'm not sure. So surgery is the process of taking that existing very good agent and like changing the innards of how it behaves so it can work with the new feature that we've added in. And then we resume training from there with the new feature. Effectively, the entire model, the brain, everything, every component, it can be distilled down to a bunch of numbers, just rows and rows and rows of numbers. That's all you need to make the bots play. What surgery does is take all these numbers, and when we add an action, effectively it adds another row somewhere, slicing in some you know, numbers that define what the new action would be like. One of the first tests we do after every surgery is we just watch a game. Sometimes you see it play reasonably, but if you made a mistake, you often see them, you know, they just all walk to the left. The scarier kinds of mistakes, the ones we don't see there, where the surgery itself worked, but for some reason something goes wrong in the training and then it like gradually learns to get worse instead of learning to get better.
between the benchmark and TI, we were trying to really think about what can we accomplish in just a few weeks to really make the biggest impact. There were all these like features of the game that were not there that would affect the rule set. And so our concern was if we show up at TI and professional teams want to play us, but they spend their time saying how our rule set is not the real Dota, this is not going to play well even if we win. Switching from five couriers to one courier had sort of been something that was on the table for a long time. It's definitely one of the weirdest aspects that we sort of added. A courier is just a guy that, he's like your gopher. He just brings you stuff. In Dota, there's usually one courier. And it takes a while for the courier to come back and forth. It's not an instant transfer. It has to go all the way back to your base, come back with its goods. If one person uses it, it means one person can't use it. The five couriers was an act of laziness on our part. When we started with 1v1, you have one hero, one courier. The obvious way of extending our, our implementation to handle five heroes was just to also have five couriers. And it just turned out that we kind of forgot to remove it until very late. Professional play has a huge part of who gets to get their items first and when and how often. And there's a law of attrition also, that if the human team is not used to receiving items at five times or 10 times the speed of a regular game, it's gonna favor the computer. And we still weren't really prepared to have the model like fully learn utilization of the courier. And so we wanted to program a logic for the courier, which actually is a pretty tough task, right? But fortunately, we had an expert in this sort of tough, weird tasks on our team in Saiho. I could be in bed right now, but instead I'm here. <laughs> You could be helping, you could be... You told me to do specific things, so I'm procrastinating this specific thing right now. <laughs> and I was telling everyone, don't worry guys, I can do this in one day. Um, it wasn't exactly one day. I was sad. Oh, why, why that? No, I... I, okay. I drank all of the coke in... Oh, every but page. This one was with, like, there is no more code. Which one? Mm. Uh, I don't know what to do. Have you noticed that I was drinking water? That's the reason. There was no more coke. There was definitely a lot of stress in the office at that time. No, I, I'm just trying to get optimist. Look at this thing. No, it's five couriers. It's five couriers. Yeah, I agree that it's five couriers. Okay, but like, if you squint, it could be one. No, it <laughs> Very last minute, we were making these changes, and at that point, we were sort of scrambling, trying to get the model to understand that it now has just one courier. Wait, maybe we just have the Philip uh, hug in there. Maybe Philip just did that. Maybe we just don't know. Okay. Oh no, we do have all the help. What? We have five couriers? Wait, on courier on, one? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, yeah, we have five couriers. On courier one? Yeah. Yeah, they're only controlling one. Oh, oh, look, they're only controlling one of them. But we have five. But we have five. We have four at the base. Or probably, there's non-zero number at the base. Right before. Shit. Do we even really know that we're going to be at all good on single courier? We, I mean, I, I, okay, we won't be very bad for sure, but we have to remember that we have an edge because we have five couriers. So it's even if we have a good single courier implementation, we are losing that edge, basically. Yeah. When we went to the single courier world, not only did the single courier itself have to do something sane, which was the part that Saiho worked on, was the scripting behind that, but it also meant that the heroes had to play a little bit differently. Now our bots have to like learn to play with it, because like now our bots have to um, think, if you know you can say think, about like a few additional things. That also meant that we had to get a ton of contract teams to play against us to figure out where we stood. Oh, we got some kills. 
Yeah, yeah, we're doing fine. Yeah, we're doing, we're doing perfectly fine. Oh. Perfectly fine? Yeah, perfectly fine. Yesterday we tried playing a game of single career against one of the best teams that we ever test against. We had an interesting late game, which like is the first time ever. We never seen the bot come back from, from a late game. Secondly, single career board. Quite well. So good! This is so good! <laughs> I've never been to TI, I've never been to any large esports gaming event. I've only been, you know, passive observer on YouTube. And that is nothing like what we saw. Experience it was just like a moment of shock for me, I guess, to take it all in. And I didn't know Dota was this popular <laughs> at all. The International is like the Super Bowl of Dota 2. You're a player, your goal is to win the International. There's no price pool that matches Dota 2's International. There's no event that's as prestigious. I've been playing this game for 12 years and it was always my dream to play at an international. I'd give away everything that I have so that I could have like one good shot at it because there's nothing like it. The moments of seeing teams up on stage walking out after a loss or walking out after a win really had a big impact. Seeing the emotion that was on the stage, you kind of realize how important this game is to those people. You know, it brings it from this thing that we watch every day where like, you know, yeah, the AI is playing Dota again, like, to really showing what it meant to the individual players. And I think that was pretty cool. Hey, I'm William. Nice to meet you. Hey, William. How do you think? My pleasure. Hello. I think one, two, three. You do? Easily. Yeah. <laughs> Easily. Nice. I think the game is, is too complicated for a bot to understand it this fast. I heard it hasn't played against uh, actual pro players. I think we'll beat it. You do? Easily, yeah. If we would lose in an actual, like, strategical way, like they just outsmart us, then I'll be scared. But if they just beat us because they're better, they just use spells faster, or like they're just more coordinated, sure. then I'd be fine with it. Because that's, it's, it, it depends, like, the, the players, they need to have a good day. There's bad days and good days. On a good day, you will just go 8-0, and and on a bad day, you'll just go 0-8. and It's so random, you know? Seems like it's going to be a great match, going to be an exciting match no matter what. Just forget about the results, forget about what we've gotten done. Just the fact that like everyone has come together and really worked to make this happen, I think that's just been an amazing thing to watch. Like we've really gelled in a way that, you know, I think like six months ago, I think we were just starting to, to kind of get a feel for each other. I think that's something that's really awesome. And also, win or lose, like we have done an awesome thing and we should be proud of it. I mean, this is not about winning, we're not in the tournament. I know everyone's stressed about like, are we gonna win, are we gonna lose? We should be excited and stressed and not like worried stressed because regardless, like we're on stage with the best in the world, like literally, so we got here. I woke up at 4 a.m. this morning, couldn't get back to sleep for two hours. I just lay there just thinking about this and thinking about all the things that we need to do and you know all the different outcomes that we could have. And like one thing I think is so exciting is that like we are truly going to learn at the same time that the whole world does. the journey of OpenAI. Of course, we did see OpenAI 5 a couple weeks ago before the International as a teaser of what's to come. And just some slight changes as we're going into this. The biggest one being that we will be playing with regular couriers. Continuing on, we'll have no illusions, no bottle, no rapier, no scan usage. What's going to happen is we're going to play three matches across three days, and there will be a different opponent each day. Today, first up is going to be none other than Pain Gaming. 
Yeah, so apparently everybody thought to themselves, what two better people to be able to commentate this game than two humans who got their asses handed to them by the OpenAI 5. For match one, I was actually in the booth with Enrique and Susan, because we had decided we would set up the game and then we would stand awkwardly behind them <laughs> while they played. It's seven minutes in, OpenAI down by only 1K, and it's holding a much better pace than I expected it to. The game started out about how we expected. There was a lot of surprise kind of in the booth. You know, the AI was doing things that they just weren't expecting. How is this possible? What the fuck is this shit? <laughs> now the TP start coming in from Payne. They do try and go for the call from Weeha. Now the Ravage. Oh, he actually gets ravaged up before he gets the call. Well, the freezing field in perfect position. They just TP into disaster on the side of Payne. Weeha does manage to cut down the jar of but instantly dies. A bad fight for Payne. And it's the first time, I believe, that OpenAI 5 is now ahead in network. I think at a certain point, the humans had the correct strategy of kind of backing off a little bit, not trying to take fights, realizing that the AI was really good at these little skirmishes that were happening along the map. Open AI 5, though, is only 1,000 net worth up, so pain are certainly very much in this game. There's this back and forth going, back and forth going. We're all in the stands and feeling those nervous butterflies. I was glad that we were like in a contained booth and sealed because you kind of like, you're able to ignore the outside roar because it is a roar. Because we are in the booth, we don't get to see what's being shown in the screen outside, right? But we can gather what is happening from the players. The humans continued avoiding the AI until they felt like they had enough of a gold lead to actually take the fights. And then they started seeking out the bots and the whole control of the game sort of shifted. Looks like Payne have figured out a way to extend it. Weeha hey. just continues to play this bottom lane out, waits for somebody to come in, stays around the area. If OpenAI is going to win this, they need to start setting traps. 4,000 gold lead now for Payne, and looks like it is time to push into the high ground. Ooh, Payne is doing it. King RD getting aggressive, oh, the double nice call. call two. They managed to catch the gyrocopter. Look how much damage HFN is putting out. So if Payne manages to force another good team fight, this could be over. We are approaching the 50-minute marker. Payne, they want to end this game now. And they might be able to do it, too. Great hit by Duster. That'll lock things down. Open AI 5 are down to 4. HFN takes the kill. That is 5 dead. And Payne Gaming have won the first game against Open AI 5. We got to have a win on the main stage. Goes to show that at least there are some humans competent enough to beat the open AI5. <laughs> I've I kept on trying to talk about it with people, like specifically Greg, and he didn't want to talk about it. I mean, I think in general we're happy with how this one went. I feel like having another game like this would be fine because like we're just worried about getting crushed um, where, it, where it feels like you can't even tell if the bot is doing the right thing or the wrong thing and I feel like there were definitely times in that game where they were doing the right thing and they were executing well. As someone who writes machine learning or AI, it's very rare that you show it off to an arena of 20,000 people and get to see how it works. Usually when you work on machine learning projects, you like write a paper and like maybe you'll give a talk and people will attend and, and you'll have some like nice like interesting feedback from, from that. Um, this is just like a different kind of thing. You built this system and now like there's 20,000 people in an arena cheering for or against it. Listening to everyone cheering or booing, reacting to how five plays, it was absolutely amazing experience. People will point out, oh, you're part of OpenAI, I saw you on stage, congratulations that feeling that people really wanted you to win and then were supporting you and then felt, you know, a little bit sad that you lost. That's the kind of thing I didn't expect to come out of this. Valve told us that they felt like it didn't make sense to play another pro team, which we also kind of agreed with given how pain went. They pitched us playing against these Chinese legends, I think is what they called them. There's a group of ex-pros that really wants to play. They're like Chinese famous all-star ex-pros. Let okay. me think fans would be really like see all these like kind of famous Chinese players. I think it would be super entertaining and fun for open to play. Okay. It's 
Tony Pixel, it's Bruno it's GLaDOS, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get ourselves ready for OpenAI Game 2 here at TI. And the biggest of Chinese legends taking to the playing field here as we get to see them come back together to go up against OpenAI in this match. Three minutes in, we're seeing four of OpenAI in lane after lane, just rotating around, finding these kills, crushing these lanes. Just storming around the map as a full five-man unit, open AI. Uh, he did up for sort of the stats first, as in mid lane. He's getting gone on yet again. Ferrari in trouble. He's got the backup of oh, RTK. Coconut bounces he correctly. cannot save him, though. As that is, I believe, the sixth time Ferrari's gone down in the middle lane. The humans need to make something happen, make something happen fast. It bears repeating, right? Like, these are TI winners. Yes. These are some of the best some of the best. Some of the best of the best. They quickly adapted to parts of the games that they saw was unusual and sort of notice some way of, sort of using that to their advantage. At some point, I think they realized our axe was doing something very silly. And so they decided to just keep going, you know, picking off axe. Back outside of the base, the two supports, Sancheng and Zhao Wei, having some fun here with the axe as they taunt him, tease him. The freezing, the holding in place as the axe should fall, and he does. The CM right click finishes him off. Open AI has got to do something spectacular to keep control as the humans are, are just getting further and further ahead. Yep. It's going to get pretty tough. One of their characters ended up being a lot stronger than any one character on our team. And I remember watching this game and being really terrified at any encounter we would have with this one overpowered character. Another kill for the gyrocopter. Yeah, and the humans keep making good play after good play, understanding the rotations and just taking those heroes as, they, as they're trying to farm, as they're trying to create space. Can OpenAI hold against the Megas, against I the team? No, I don't think you can with that lineup right now. So now there's only, yeah, only Witch Doctor, and he's going to die. Oh, like that the group. Death Ward, symbolically used there in honor of his own death. As OpenAI taken down again, your Chinese legends have done it. ROTK burning, Ferrari 430, Sancheng. Well, that was a fantastic play from them. Again, taking control of that game, having a great, great time with burning at that gyrocopter. Yeah. Yeah, RTZ maybe needs to take some <laughs> I just wish that we at least won one game because I think the crunch of the last two weeks was pretty exhausting for a lot of people on the team. We ex kind of expected that things might not turn out that well, but it still would have been nice yeah, to win. Yeah, Vancouver was hard. We didn't expect to to straight up win, but we had a we had hope. That second game, for me, was just... It wasn't anything more than the previous games. Like, well, okay, we're not there yet. Can't beat an 18 yet. TI was still, I think, a success. Even though we didn't beat any of the teams there, we did hold our own. Like, it was a struggle. You could tell they were working hard. But they still knew how to overcome them, so... There's such a massive difference between five very skilled players playing together and then a pro team that practices and plays full time together. The Chinese All-Star stack, well, there were five professional players, but that wasn't even a team. And Pain Gaming, you know, great bunch of lads, but they weren't really the, you know, one of the best teams at that international. The fact that the AI wasn't able to beat those two teams you know, it certainly meant there would be a lot more work that they would have to do. I think it kind of reset some of my thoughts a bit. Some of that initial, you know, feeling of awe at what the bots achieved competing against the caster team, the more conventional, what was standardly understood about Dota and how to play it was what prevailed. The professional teams competing at TI8, their way of playing Dota was at least shown to be better than what OpenAI was doing at the time. It's been six months since TI. 
the bot has gotten better. It's gotten better less quickly than it was getting better before TI, which has made us all a little bit frustrated. Before TI, there was this magical, it was like incredibly fast growth. And since then, it's slowed down. For the past two months, it's been pretty up and down. We've sort of labeled it as wiggling, which is when our graphs wiggle up and down, but don't really make any clear progress. We have an idea, like, look, this has to work. We just need to push it harder, take it to the next level. Like, it has to work, right? And, and it doesn't. Sometimes people will be out of the office and the bots are just tanking, and you're like, oh my god, like, what do we do? Like, we're wasting all this compute, and it's getting worse. In normal development, you just write rules, what has to happen. But here, we don't write those rules. We try to point in specific directions. This thing is very important. It, it would be nice if you could spend more time with that. Hopefully, we will be better. Hopefully. Sometimes the effect is completely opposite. Actually, quite often, that's the case. In general, the experiment, I would label as kind of fragile. It's been through a lot. and. There's a bunch of other things that we want to do that just kind of like don't work out the way you want it to. But it is much better than it was at TI. And so in about a month, we're going to play the winners of TI in a, in a public game. One way or another, this will actually be the last competitive milestone for the project. And the real goal for us is never about beating teams, but the real goal for us is AI progress. We want to take this system and distill down to general purpose technologies that we're able to apply to other domains. The power of flowers and friendship. I've done it here, ladies and gentlemen. Your grand champions of TIA. It's OG. OG is the most recent winner of the international. They have won the biggest prize pool ever. They're just such a cool team because they were never meant to do it. A pretty big site for Dota ranked the teams in order of their chances, and OG got dead last, 18th. They had to play through what is called an open qualifier. They barely got through in a best of five. I think it was the score was three to two. So they were one game away from not making it in the first place. They didn't look all that impressive going into it, and they did it. It was so wild. They did it. Witnessing their success from the underdog position was just really exciting. It was pretty evident in the crowd how excited people were that you've got these underdogs that kind of just end up winning TI. So those guys are going to play against OpenAI, and I think they're going to win. I mean, they're so good. They're so talented. I sat down with one of my coworkers who's really interested in probability and odds about whether or not I thought we would beat OG. I think the number that ended up coming out was like 63%. I don't know how I feel about that number. It's lower than I would have wanted it to be going into this final match, but I think it's pretty honest. We all watched at TI those games, like riveted watching those games. And they're just, they're really good. So I don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I feel uncertain. Don't become good at these games because you have one play or one trick up your sleeve. Usually professional players will study mid-game what's going on and based on that completely adapt their way of playing. I would say 60%, 70%. I think um, I think we have solid like 80% chance of winning. I'd say we have at least an 80% chance, but I hope that by the end would be like closer to 90, 95. I think we only have like a 30 or 40% chance. <laughs> the pessimism comes from the fact that we just haven't really been able to measure progress. And we've seen our, all the metrics that we have in place that traditionally told us that we were doing better are currently failing. We also, as of last week, lost against one of our test teams, which is the first time this has happened since, I think, TI. So that seems to suggest there's something possibly lurking in the shadows um, that's pretty scary.
So today we're going to be playing OpenAI. This is the latest iteration as far as I know. The road to playing OpenAI in San Francisco has been a long one. We've all been on different teams throughout our individual journeys, but we got together with this iteration before the International 8 and managed to win. So I guess this is what leads us here. Best team in the, the robotics versus the best team in the, in the flesh. Obviously, it's a different aspect of Dota. And Dota is a game we're very passionate about. And we've seen a lot of stuff in Dota, obviously. We play against all the teams from all over the world. Uh, now we're playing against a new opponent, a new Dota opponent. So that's super exciting. Uh, it pushes certain aspects of the game to limits we've never seen before. First game might be the hardest. But after that, I like to believe that we're going to know what we have to do to beat it. We went through all this stuff that you guys are going through, like literally the exact conversation we had about Necro, about what will they do if we just cut waves? <laughs> we, have, yeah. we had all this same talk, it was so funny. Yeah. No, they like, lost. We still lost in 20. Yeah. So it's not bad, like it'll give you a rough game. It's just such a weird style that like even if you think through this stuff, you have to play it once to like understand what's going on. It's uh, about an hour before the first game starts. We are doing last minute preparations, making sure everyone knows how to connect to the game. Uh, I'm feeling pretty nervous going into it. I'm trying not to focus too much on the win or loss because I mean, to be honest, it's really not main intent. Although like going into a game, you, you always want to win. You always want it to be a good game. I feel pretty good. I'm excited. Uh, it was fun to set up the players on stage. They seem to be pretty comfortable. So yeah, I can't wait to see what happens. We are 36 minutes away from the stream coming on. I think we're six minutes away from doors opening. And so then we'll fill the seats and start off with our best of three with OG. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Open AI 5 Final. <laughs> We're still out. We're here for Open AI 5 Finals 2019, and we have a very fun day ahead of us. Before anything else, I'd like to give the stage to Greg Brockman, who is the chairman and CTO of Open AI. Yeah. This is a historic moment. It's going to be the first time that an AI has even attempted to play the world champions in an eSports game. OG is just on another level relative to any other team that we've played. And so the truth is, we don't know what's going to happen either. But this event, it's really about something bigger than who wins and who loses. It's about letting people connect with a strange, exotic, but still somehow very tangible intelligences that are produced by today's rapidly progressing AI technology. So please enjoy the show and just keep in mind, no matter how surprised the AIs are to us, know that we're gonna be even more surprising to them. All right, let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, the International 2018 Champions. Ready picks on here with Cap, and we're ready for this game one of OpenAI 5 versus OG. We've just seen the draft, Cap. It's going to be a lot of group up and go, and this is what we've seen in the past. OpenAI be very strong at this old five man Dota. Oh, already up top. The action's kicking off as OpenAI will claim first blood. Oh, jeez. Look at that. That's already gone up quite a bit since the drafting phase. The trash talk has already begun. OpenAI diving past the tower. They'll find no tower, but they dove pretty deep for this, the OpenAI. The reaction will be there from OG. They have both the combo of the SF and the Shaker to bring down the Gyrocopter. So aggressive plays from the OpenAI, but it does end up in a trade that favors OG on that top lane. All right, let's just keep playing the map. Let's yeah, take, yeah, a, yeah. take a favorable keep fight. Keep playing the map. Keep the easiest fight possible. We don't need to do it. 
You see Jax, he's going to look for a wraparound on mid. The setup's there with the Fisher. Open AI's blocked in. Nowhere for the Death Prophet to run, as that will be another kill here for Thompson. Open AI once again looking to dive in deep past the tower with this Gyrocopter and Sven combination. No tail keeping the two of them alive as OG's able to turn, bring down the Sven. Still though, trying for this SF. Jara desperate for the kill, but he cannot find it. He's gonna get it as with the Fisher and the heels from No Tail. And OG again able to hold on despite the aggressive plays from the open AI on that top lane. We can fight them. Pretty simple. Yep, I just do, need to get we, here I'm to thinking, get my item. Do, do we have to fight them? No. No, but it's what we no, should DPO want to, right? Ultimate. I want to fucking win, so I want to no. fucking crush them 5v5. There's a huge psychological aspect to Dota. When you play against other players, uh, like a lot of players are going to be too aggressive, not aggressive enough, scared, whatever, all these you know, human emotions. When you play against that, about the feeling I, I got instantly is that it's just here to do what it's supposed to do at any given time. And so then you feel like your ego, it's a handicap, kind of. 10 minutes in, eight to nine, less than a 1K lead here at the moment for the AI. It's an incredibly close start to the match. Back towards mid Thompson, and he's able to chase down the CM. A big old comes out fight. though. Oh, oh, that's beautiful. Oh my god. Oh, oh the god. open AI. Crystal Maiden doing it big time there. And in fact, they're going to get this SF as well. The Crystal Maiden going big, standing her ground. She knew she'd get those two kills. For the first game, we felt like we had the game under control. We got what we wanted and needed to get ourselves in a very winning position. Let's get the top pressure again. Like they're running oh, back yeah. here. Yeah, I yeah. think we should fight, but we, we need Ana. Yeah, we're not in position yet. And it seems like OG has found a kind of pattern to take it to the AI, but they are going to lose two here, it looks they like. Are. This team, OpenAI, will not stay down. They get immediately back into the game. The game was super close and super nerve-wracking for like a really long time until five gave like the 95% win probability. As uh, back, really? on, back on form, it's a 95% here for OpenAI. From our human perspective, this is an even game, Owen. How are they saying 95%? This game does not look one-sided. It's very even in the net worth. OpenAI, though, feeling incredibly confident with themselves, and they are going to dive in past the tower. Sven will make sure that no tails pushed all the way back, but OpenAI, they've got two more kills. They have one play, because keep in oh mind. My God. One play, what they're doing. Uh, we got caught several times in the game thinking that, you know what, it looks decent for them but we probably have 5% chances to outplay them right now or to out-execute them. So let's take that chance. And obviously that's our ego talking. Seb and Jarex fall, they snipe down. No tail, right up to the high ground. The death of it has the fuel set to control the Anna. Anna's gonna fall as well. As open AI, they're into the base. It's 19 minutes in, they're taking the tier three tower. OG losing hero after hero once again. OpenAI now with a 28,000 network lead. OG's Ancient exposed. They are trying to keep them drawn away from the Ancient, but it doesn't matter. The creeps are on the Ancient. GG is called, and OpenAI take game one and cap. They look pretty terrifying. For me, the scariest thing of all was when we were talking about this looks like an even game, and yeah. AI says, no, we actually have a 95% chance to win this game. That's how superior, apparently, their analysis of that game was. They were absolutely bang on, and pretty much from that moment onwards, it was them in the driving seat. That was fun uh, and stressful. <laughs> I think Ojiva is quite confident in their team fighting ability. This is the one they mentioned where the five can coordinate perfectly, but now OG does have a chance to really learn from this game. Like one of the big things is that they get to learn and adjust their strategy, while we don't. We don't learn from this game at all. Open AI 5 versus OG Game 2. Let's see what is going to change here the second game. We've had the different drafts. Open AI a little less sure in comparison to as they were at the draft of Game 1 this time round. Both teams sort of playing a game of a chicken here with one another, yeah. seeing who will push each other over the edge. Topson will have the south. I'm dead, I think. Just keep running. As the chase continues top, south will be popped, but he gets cancelled here by the stun. Open AI diving past the tower with the damage from the Viper and the Sven. They'll claim the Slark's life. They'll get no tail as well. The AI turning it up early here in this game too. Oh, 95% now. Six minutes in, Open AI already just getting objectives much faster than they were able to in game one. 
they are playing at a ferocious speed here in the second game. For the second game, we got the real open AI treatment uh, where they got what they wanted. They got a lot of the lanes, they started grouping up and we felt like we couldn't really play our way out of that group up. I'm sitting there staring at the screen like, I have no idea, right? We just kept pulling off these plays. Thompson, he's desperately looking for this crystal meta, but the movements here <laughs> with the Shadow Amulet dancing right. herself away. Dude, utilizing oh, to make sure wow. that Thompson cannot get that final hit on her. <laughs> Continuing to use the amulet, getting away out of this. Thompson, can he find this? He does get the vision for the assassinate, but oh, then disabled. The stun comes out from the cast, canceling the assassinate. The crystal made it kept safe and alive. All right, that's pretty good. Fucking lost. OG, they cannot catch a break this game. This is pure domination from OpenAI, start to potentially an early finish. 17 minutes in, there looks like there's very little chance of OG turning this one around as OpenAI almost playing around with them at this point. You got, 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 got it, you got it, you got it, you got it. Kill Orange, kill Orange. All right. Come on! Fucking die. GG. GG. <laughs> the ancient will fall, and that is GG game over. OpenAI taking game two, taking the series two to zero. But honestly, this second game in particular, this is a fantastic example of something that, as a player of Dota 2, as a professional, you watch how OpenAI just absolutely crushed this 20 minutes of gameplay, and there's got to be a lot to learn from the way that they played this game. I mean, it's like not the situation that you prepare for because you don't want to be overly optimistic. You don't want to like get your confidence up and like, so we've, we've been focusing for months now on the 0-2 situation, on the 1-2 situation, and to be in this, this spot is, is very exciting. So, we've been working really hard for a really long time. I'm also really tired. <laughs> but, um, I don't know, I just, I didn't, it's been a lot of trouble the last few weeks trying to get the experiment working well. It's um, it's been difficult to get it to. We've had problems. We have training problems, and I think everyone was like really nervous about this. So I can't hold it. <laughs> but it's just we did it. You know, we did it. <sighs> Having this machine like being able to out reflex you over and over and over and over and over again doesn't sit well with me. But yeah, today humans lost. I'm trying to think what did we do better than them today. I had a hard time coming up with stuff. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure actually, like what did we beat them at? Uh, that's, that's pretty scary. It might sound weird, but I think we're still very confident, even though we lost pretty hard today. I don't think we're at the point where we were like, wow, this is undoable. I think we're still like, oh, come on, man. Give us another game, uh, we can still beat it. All right, everybody, eyes right in the lens and big smiles, please. Ready? And one, two, three. We're doing a lot of photos, so keep going. As we were coming up to finals, we were trying to think of ways to give back to the community. We've asked a lot from the community, and they have given us a lot back, but we need to give them something back. Arena was this event where anyone on the internet could play against it, and it was really exciting. Now we're like sharing it with people, letting everyone poke at it and play with it and see how it goes. We had a lot of people playing at once. We set up streams so that you could watch them playing, and it was a little bit of an overwhelming couple of days where we were like 24-7 watching the stream, waiting for people to win. People were playing it all over the world. Lots of players in Asia, lots of players in Eastern Europe, Western Europe. Over 7,000 competitive games played. We lost 42 games. In the 42 games that we lost, there were some patterns. You would see the same teams beating us multiple times as they figured out the strategy. So how does this happen? How come you have this bot? One day, it beats the best human players. Next day you hear, some people on the internet were able to beat it, exploit some weaknesses somehow. It's important to think about how does this bot get its intelligence playing against itself over and over and over. And initially, it has some strategy. It plays against itself. Strategy becomes better, better, better over time. And so there's this whole sequence of strategies it goes through. And the final bot has learned to beat all those strategies. But if now you come up with a completely different strategy, very different from anything in that sequence of strategies it has been playing against when playing itself, it's going to be surprised. 
in our Libratus project, we introduced this new kind of module, which we call the self-improver. That looks at what are the actions that the adversaries have taken, and then overnight fills its own holes in its strategy. The bot would play against itself using that action. And so the bot was able to figure out why it was winning after it took that action. Now, this wasn't an instantaneous process. It would take some time. And in fact, it took about 12 hours for the bot to fill in this weakness. And this is incredibly important if you want to apply these techniques in the real world. To achieve the level of reliability in your system so you can handle every possible variation in the real world is just still really, really hard. And that's exactly why we still don't have self-driving cars, because it's so hard to deal with all that variation you're going to encounter when driving. When we first started the project, we didn't know if people would want to play against us. We didn't know if people would want to watch. There's something very human about like improving at this game. I think some people were a little hesitant at first to have an AI come in and kind of like beat the game. But that would sort of like take something away. But I think if you look at things like chess, which did sort of like get beaten by AI, it didn't really take away from being a really good chess player. It kind of gives back to the game itself because you can learn things. Seeing the OpenAI bot speed OG was at least on some level a shock. I was, I was taken aback. It definitely changed my perspective and how um, I perceive the game of Dota and just the way it can be analyzed. I think most of us went back to watch these games. They were very interesting. Oh boy. Oh my god. Oh, that's painful to watch actually. There we go. This is this is nightmare inducing. This is actually really interesting. We have four people dead. He's the only one alive. This hero is really about to die, right? But it has a trick to like switch from being invisible to being visible. He's kind of risking his life. I actually think Topson has him dead here. Now he turns and uses a spell on him. Usually this would be called straight up taunting in Dora. It's like, that guy is not only beating me, he's also humiliating me and it feels really bad. And most players would play much worse once that happens because they start getting annoyed and frustrated. And he's doing it, I mean, I get, I'm getting annoyed at watching this. Instead of running, he stands still and is about to cast a spell and this guy, his, his friend, or I don't he's not his friend, whatever, like, is gonna be able to kill Thompson. It actually looks like he's baiting him in, which is just very human. Baiting is like a human term, right? So, I don't know, queuing some X-Files music right now. <laughs> in our work on poker, we often get asked how do you program the AI to bluff? And the short answer is, we don't. Bluffing is not a psychological phenomenon. It's rather a mathematical phenomenon. Bluffing is about probability. It's saying, I have a weak hand. If I just play it safe, I'm not going to win with this weak hand. If I bet, then I know an expectation my opponent will fold and I will make more money than if I didn't bet. And that's all a bluff is. And so you can get an AI to learn how to bluff just by playing against itself. Thinking about OpenAI and why it does what it does, I think is very rewarding for any team. I think every team should ask itself that now that they have the opportunity. You play against it, you realize that it has a play style that is different. It's, it's doing things that you've never done and you've never seen. Sometimes it looks extremely silly. But then again, like it's, are you gonna be human and be like, hey, this looks very stupid, like this is, this is bad? or you try to take it to the next steps, like why is it doing this? So us humans, we have a role system in Dota. You plan strategies according to your role division. You pick your heroes according to it. We have our position one and two that we try to buff up until they're strong enough to win the game. Open AI, no roles, nobody cares. They have kind of a musical going on that we don't have going on at all as people for the most part. Everybody has that one item that just makes them a little bit stronger and then they strike and try and end the game. That gave us ideas. Then you realize that we're guilty of being stuck in a team dynamic, whereas sometimes we have to be way more flexible. 
it's extremely hard and I don't think if I had to put a number on it it's like if OpenAI does that like the dynamic switch at a hundred percent we maybe went from I don't know five percent to ten percent but that is already a difference we've noticed it Tier 2 tower, they have friends to help Mount Thompson. He's the man that's going, going, going into the mountain once again. This is soul breaking. JJ! Oh, JJ! <laughs> In 2019, at the international, Team OG showed up with the same roster, but once again, they weren't favorites to win the tournament. The season leading into the international did not go so well for them. I personally did not back them. There were so many other teams that were dominant throughout the season. Together you stand, together you die, and together you GG. Newbie are out, OG have knocked them down to the lower bracket. I think sort of after the first few days of main event, People were like, all right, they're gonna do it again. They proved me wrong in the most spectacular way. They gained a lot of ground throughout the group stage, and then they went into playoffs and just demolished everybody. OG in the upper bracket finals, bring down LGD. OG are going to the grand finals for the second year in a row. I mean, they did have something that allowed them to win, and you know, this X Factor, everybody's always looking for it, and maybe OpenAI found it, and maybe professional teams can, can learn from it. OG, you throw your sword on game two, you throw your sword on game three, there it is, gold! OG, I am two time TI champion, they've done it, folks! And in what a fashion, these last three games didn't even seem cold. One of the reasons why it was so impressive, no one had been able to do it. No team had won it back to back. No team had won it two times at all. And, uh, you know, really has cemented themselves as, you know, this five stack of, of players is, it is the best team of all time in Dota 2. exciting part of the day. When we trained the OG bot, we basically trained this one system continuously for 10 months. There were a lot of minor to major code changes over the course of that time, but the lineage of the bot is like you can trace it back all the way to these random parameters that we started with in July of 2018. When you look at the game of Dota, there is all these classical AI research problems. There is long horizons, 20,000 steps to play the game. There is partial observability. You don't get to see everything that's happening. And then what you observe is still very large. 10,000 plus variables every moment that your system has to take in. Most researchers, including me, would think, hey, probably you're gonna need new methodologies to solve this. But OpenAI took the bet and said, hey, what if we just really scale this up? And sure, a ridiculous amount of self-play was done, a ridiculous amount of data, but they showed that actually, if you do scale this up, you don't need these new methods. Existing reinforcement learning was shown good enough to crack this problem. There's this concept of sample efficiency. How many times do you have to try something out before you really learn it? This is going to be one of the major challenges for AI research going forward. How do we make these algorithms more sample efficient? Because when you're acting in the real world, you're not able to collect trillions of examples. You're not able to play trillions of games of Dota 2. We need to have this sample efficiency where we can collect data from real world experiences. And once we're able to do that, then suddenly it unlocks a lot of opportunities for AI to be deployed in real world situations where we don't have an exact model. I think one of the keys will be some sort of background knowledge the what is the assumed structure that people just commonly understand is in the world so that you don't have to learn everything the hard way. Dota helped us create this large-scale reinforcement learning technology and the techniques to really make it shine. 
we actually took that, we applied it to physical robotics. And so we were able to solve a robotics problem of controlling a robotic hand that no one had been able to solve for many decades. And now actually the robotics team has taken the next step and has been able to not just control a hand to, to do a simple task of manipulating a block, but they can actually solve an entire Rubik's cube. And so the complexity of tasks that we're able to solve just keeps marching up and to the right. It's really cool to work on a very hard problem that you don't believe it's possible. And then suddenly, like with small steps, it looks like it's more and more probable that it's going to happen. And it's suddenly achievable. And then because it's achievable, it's no longer interesting. So personally, I am just waiting for the next project because obviously this one is easy. We've done it, like who cares? I just want to have next impossible task. All right, after watching that, don't you think that Susan and, and David in, deserve a huge round of applause for what they accomplished? <laughs> All right, so we'd love to hear the inside story. How representative was the documentary of real, of real life? And in particular, I'd love to hear uh, maybe a surprise or a dark day or something that may not have been shown in the documentary that you might want to share with us. David, do you want to go first? Um, one thing that the first time I saw the documentary, I was really impressed by how it captures very well sort of the day-to-day -day activity of doing work on this project. There's just like all those scenes of a couple of people sitting on a computer, like scratching their heads, saying like, <laughs> what's the bug? Why is it breaking? Like, wh why does this plot look like that? And I think it did a really good job of capturing that. Um, yeah, just like what it was like to be in those rooms and, and try to figure out each of these small problems that could allow the big experiment to, to come together. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there and not okay. think about a surprise. Yeah, I think I remember it being much more chaotic, maybe, <laughs> at times. And I, I think the thing that came to mind was actually the, um, in the finals. That day, we actually found a bug in the system where there was a, a permutation of like human players and like which side picked first that we never tested for some reason in all of our human tests. And so that day, we were testing this one, it was like there's four combinations, right? Somehow we just tested all three, repeatedly just missed that one. Um, and that day, we, you know, we backstage, we were just trying, we we're like, the code doesn't work, right? Everything just, if, if we went for this combination, nothing would run, right? So up until the very last second, we were trying to fix the system. So I think that was kind of probably what we were doing throughout, you know, kind of flying by the seat of our pants. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll definitely second that. Like, I think maybe the, you don't get a sense from documentary of just like, just how much effort went into the sort of system stability side of things. Like, there's times when I think a documentary like Michael says, like, I was really relieved that, that it went well. And I don't think he was talking about winning the game. He was talking about the game not crashing. <laughs> yeah. Great. This, uh, by the way, well, I'll start the conversation. And there are cards. So please uh, add, write your, your how you want to get into the conversation. Hold those up. And the team will bring those forward. So um, I did ask about sort of biggest surprises or darkest day. You know, it, we, lo we love the journey when you come out as heroes and the victory, but uh, you mentioned it's chaotic. Um, what were some of the either biggest challenges or one of the, the days that you thought this, this really isn't gonna, isn't gonna happen? Can you share that part of the experience? Um, yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of little surprises on like a day-to-day -day basis of like, why did this thing not work or that thing not work? And I, it was, I think we were very bad at predicting which things would be easy and which things would be hard. Mm -hmm. We'd often be surprised that something that seemed like a small fix to patch up some little thing would, would break everything. But some large addition that, that we thought would be uh, like very fiddly, we had to try it 10 times, would work on the first try. But I think if you step back and think about what's like really the most surprising, it's this thing that uh, I think Peter Abiel says it at the end of the, of the documentary, that it's just surprising that it worked. That, you know, we had this plan that we were going to try scaling up this reinforcement learning method, try scaling it much further than no one's ever scaled it before. Eventually, it would stop working, and then we'd do some research to figure out why it had stopped working. But instead, it didn't stop, and it just 
you know, worked all the way up. And that, it's sort of no longer surprising because we've internalized that lesson, but at the time I think that was in some sense the biggest surprise. Yeah, I think the time between TI and finals were pretty much rough throughout because I think there was some component where you just imagine you just keep training and things will just work and so there's nothing more to do. But then when you look at all these metrics, you know, that's supposed to tell us things are getting better or worse or whatever, they just didn't show anything. And so I think that team spent a lot of time. There was a, there was a, uh, I think we laughed at this, the, a whiteboard. Uh, there's a, where we were sort of outlining all the different things we we're trying, and we had to like merge all this code back in, and we called it the merge of doom. <laughs> and that's you know kind of just like it goes back to the chaos, right? You, ev the team, you know, everyone kind of had different ideas for how to take things, and I think nine times out of ten, these ideas didn't work. But you know, you still had to try them, and that was it, it is a very draining experience to do that. So as you you've had some distance now to look back at the experience, what are some of the kind of takeaways or lessons that you have? whether on a personal, professional, or in your research that you've um, taken from that experience? Susan, I'll start with you. Oh, I think, yeah, since then, um, I guess I've also moved on to work on like different kinds of problems that are maybe a little bit more interpretable in a way, mostly like in the language modeling, image modeling space. Um, but, but I would say, it's almost, it's still just as opaque as before almost, right? Mm -hmm. Like you try to, develop explanations, write all these papers, right? read all these other papers that other people are writing, and you think there must be some you know, method behind all this madness of how to you know, improve these systems and make them actually be useful or intelligent in some form. Um, but I would say we're, we're still just as confused, maybe. Like, I think f what, what, what really um, sort of caught my attention was in the, in the end when the players were saying how they, the bot must have been taunting them, right? So, this is a very human behavior, how you bait. And I think it's very easy for us as researchers when you're working with these systems to imbue a lot of meaning onto them. And whenever, especially if they're models that you train, you're like, wow, they learned you know, this novel language, right? They must be so intelligent. When really it's kind of just memorizing its data set, right? So I think this is where it's very easy to fall into that trap of thinking we're much further ahead than we actually are. Important, David? Um, I think similar to the, my, and that's why I gave the previous question, like one important lesson we learned was, was this, this scale, the sort of the importance of scale. We, like there were already a lot of inklings of this in the research field, like when this project was starting, but I think this was one of the things that really convinced us that, um, you know, the future of making the best models we possibly could to solve the hardest problems really would involve carefully scaling up these uh, systems to really uh, use an enormous amount of compute. Speaking of scale, th that leads me to a question about sort of who gets to make the decision, who makes the decisions. Clearly the people, the organizations that have the largest uh, amount of resources, compute power, uh, and all the other resources needed to take on this kind of a problem are the ones that are where the concentration of work is going on. What kinds of implications does that have for other kinds of, you know, for people who are making the decision of what we're, what we're studying, who's going to apply it, who benefits? Um, thoughts on that aspect of uh, the implications for society more broadly? Yeah, I mean, these are a lot of really important and really tough questions. I think, our, you know, OpenAI's mission and the mission of many players in this field is ultimately to make these really powerful systems and distribute the benefits of them to everyone. And that's, I think people always, it's easy to, to see how we don't understand how to do the first part of making the powerful systems. Uh, I think people tend to underestimate how hard the second part is also of making sure that the benefits are distributed widely to everyone because, you know, historically, whenever there's been huge advances in technology, they often improve the average quality of life for everyone, but they also tend to concentrate power in the hands of the people who control it. And so we have to be, cognizant of that and careful to avoid it. Uh, there is one thing that we sometimes consider like a silver lining of the fact that it requires so much compute, which is that one thing we're afraid of is with these super powerful technologies, if it becomes very easy to get it, then everyone, including bad actors, could get it very easily. And if it is in fact really hard to get it, at least sort of everyone will know who has these systems and who has them available and uh, so we can monitor them a little bit. But that's the best of silver lining. Yeah, this is a really hard question, and I think on the bright side, um, I guess you can hope that as compute gets cheaper, it, the barrier to entry becomes lower. And we're sort of seeing that now with more and more 
entities, even you know, other startups as well, are able to train these models at the, at the scale. Um, there's even a like, big science, like open science effort doing the same thing. So at some point, these models will be open. It's just unfortunate that, you know, as of now, right, most of the discourse is dominated by large industry players who have the resources to you know, even access these models in the first place. But hopefully that will change, I think. And we're seeing that change happen I guess, fairly quickly. Um, and so as we develop better methodologies to actually run these large models more efficiently, hopefully more and more researchers um, can get access to them. Thank you. Well, we've, we've had a few years, and you've done, you're working on new projects, moved on to new organizations in the case of you. Susan, t tell us about the kind of com compelling questions that you're working on right now in AI. So I might be limited on what I can say, um, <laughs> but um, I, I mean, I think I, I still care deeply about you know, open science um, and, and at scale, right? So these are mostly the, the two top of mind questions that I've, I've been focusing my time on, and hopefully we'll be able to you know, talk more detail about that in a few months <laughs> if things go well. Great. Yeah, I think David? that the, the most interesting questions are sort of always going to be flavors of how can we make these most powerful, largest models more powerful and more effective and, and more useful. Um, and so I think we've all been working on like different variants of that, uh, and I'm definitely focusing on that now and sort of how to train the models as, as efficiently and, and productively uh, as possible. Um, one thing that maybe uh, is interesting is OpenAI as a whole has also moved much more towards uh, we've just sort of started, since this movie uh, came out, we've started having this uh, API where we really do share this uh, technology with anyone who, who you know, signs up and, and, and wants to use it. And so, you know, we're, we're maybe trying to start practicing, doing some research and getting a handle on how we can distribute the, the benefits and the power of these systems to people. But it's a, a long road ahead of us there. Well, let's turn to some of the questions. A lot of questions here. A lot. Uh, speaking of somebody who would like to distill the model to a smaller scale, somebody wants to run it on their laptop, so that's good. There are several questions here about funding. How is the whole operation funded? Um, how much did it cost? Can you comment on that? Um, uh, yeah, I think one thing people I think don't realize is that it takes a huge amount of compute to train the model. Uh, because you have to play these millions of games against itself over and over and over again. Once you have the model trained, at, at least for these uh, reinforcement learning models, it actually wasn't that much compute to run the model. Uh, I think it wasn't actually happening on a laptop, but it, at least the early models could run on a laptop, and the late ones maybe could run on a single server or something like that. Um, but yeah, th these models are actually not super expensive to run once you've trained them. The expensive thing was training them. That's, of course, you know, uh, an answer that's two years out of date. And now the latest uh, AI models, the, the giant language models, still can't be run on a laptop. Uh, but they're still much, much less than the training process. Here's a question about the choice of game. Are there other games you think would be particularly interesting for AI? Dota has a lot of collaboration, partial information, et cetera. So choice of Dota and also other games that might be interesting. I, I, I thought about. Civ 6 at some point. <laughs> that could be a fun game, especially if it's like something that you can extrapolate to the real world um, in some form or fashion. But it's, I don't think there's as big of an audience for that. So maybe that would be harder to pursue. I don't know if you have any other. You know, there are a ton of games that I play and I enjoy playing. And I really wish I had an AI of this level to like watch it play. It could be really cool. Yeah. Um, but from a research perspective, I feel like we sort of like, you know, we did this Deep Mind StarCraft. And we sort of feel like similar games, you know, we could spend the compute to, to make similar agents, but we sort of already done the research project. And uh, we, yeah, the, we don't know like, if they're really going to teach us new lessons compared to what this taught us. Yeah, I mean, after all, I think it, this is really expensive for a video game bot. Right. <laughs> so uh, it might not make sense to continue pushing in that direction for scale. Here's a question that goes deeper into uh, some of the work that you were doing. How are the RI actions, the war rewards defined, given there are so many potential actions with different short-term and long-term costs and rewards? Um, I, so I guess the question is just like, 
how did we decide when to give it carrots and sticks uh, in the game? Um, well, I think the, the closest approximation is basically we took how you would like explain the game to a human. You know, you're trying to attack your opponents and kill these units and protect those units. And we kind of map that in some heuristic way to, okay, so you get one point for killing a tower and minus 0.3 points for whatever. Um, and then we tweaked it a few times after that based on experiments, but not that much, sort of that original thing. Mm -hmm. Like that, that rough structure mostly stayed put. I think then there were like maybe 20 or 30 different events that you got some positive or negative reward for. Yeah, we, I mean, we gradually added over time. Yeah. I think it's just, that, that's, that's where this whole like surgery idea kind of came from. It was like when you started training, we had only a subset of the things we wanted and then we were like, well, might as well add some more as we went on and it somehow worked. So we just kept slowly adding a little bit at a time. Yeah. Here's another one. Uh, how do you constrain APM click uh, accuracy or how do you featureize um, partially opaque effects like smoke? Oh man, um, so long ago. <laughs> I, I have to dig back in your memory yeah. to go back to so, this level of detail. Uh, the, the APM thing, we basically, the way it worked was, so Dota runs at, I might get some of these numbers wrong, it's a long time ago. <laughs> Dota runs at 30 frames per second. Uh, like, you know, if, if you click as fast as possible, Dota will only recognize 30 clicks per second. And we sort of grouped those into groups of four or five uh, ticks. I think it was four, so about a seventh of a second. And the model could only act uh, on that time scale, which was something like... 250 milliseconds? 250 milliseconds. Yeah. So it was sort of on the same order of magnitude as a human, but uh, of course it could, it like never got distracted the way a human would. So it definitely had some advantage. And there were long, long debates at the time about what exactly would be unfair and what would be fair to do here. Because on the one hand, we don't want to give it an unfair advantage that humans don't have. On the other hand, you know, a self-driving car is actually gonna be better at not getting distracted than a human would be. So it's hard to define what's a fair and unfair comparison. Hmm. Here's a question about uh, AI learning. Will AI be ever be able to learn in real time while it's playing a game? I would imagine it's possible. Um, you know, there's, there's a quite a few like online continual learning sort of areas of research, right, where you can imagine just like extending training. And if you had a system that can feed back that quickly to update the model live, it's entirely possible. I would say it's probably even more expensive to probably keep up like, you know, to, to learn and adapt in real time that way. Um, especially if you're, you know, as we're going into the world of these like giant massive language models, that's a whole other, whole other, you know, question. Um, but these are tiny in comparison for playing a video game. But yeah, I think it's really important. Like, that's definitely a thing that humans do and that you need to do to interact intelligently in the real world. You need to learn within one sort of lifetime. Um, and these models don't do it at all, and it's a big uh, area that we need to fix. Uh, speaking of learning, uh, that's the last one from, that we have time for from the audience. Jeff Hinton and Yana Kun have said that the future of AI is self-supervised learning. What is the future of reinforcement learning and how can it be applied to real world problems? I, I would say almost in, the, in our setup, right, it's almost a little bit self-supervised, right? But kind of you squint, right? Self-play and this vague definition of reward system, um, it's already giving it the supervision through the definition of the environment that you put it in. Um, so it's, I would say, I mean, I don't know how else to map that, but it's already kind of fitting in the same box as, you know, what you would call self-supervised learning in other domains. But I mean, it's certainly accurate that in the two years since this, the field has moved more towards self-supervised learning and, and uh, away from reinforcement learning because, it, it, you know, because it's so hard to get the data uh, and, and apply it in the real world. And we have tons and tons of self-supervised learning in the real world. So these large language models uh, are more like self-supervised than they are like reinforcement learning. Wish we had more time. It was fascinating to talk to you. Uh, we have a tradition here at the museum of ending each of our programs with a question where we've asked you what's one word of advice that you would give to a person starting out in their career. So, Susan, oh, sure. what's your one word? If you could tell us what it is and if, what's the story behind why you chose it. Yes, so my word's abundance. Um, I chose it mostly because I think I spent a lot of my time fixated on the opposite of this word, which is scarcity. Um, and I find it very unfortunate, uh, mostly because 
it's really easy just to think about all the things that you lack, uh, but harder to think about you know, having more than that, right? Having the time to actually explore or having you know, just the space to, to let yourself kind of be free in a way, whereas it's you know, much easier to think that you're obligated to continue down whatever path you've been continuing down this whole time. And I think this also functioned my upbringing to some degree. You know, I think growing up in an immigrant family, um, it, was, it was definitely moments where I feel like I internalized a lot of that mentality of like just having to survive in this country. And so it wasn't until I moved to the Bay Area that I really see this like abundant thinking, right? The kind of exploration that people do here with their careers and you know, especially in startups. So um, I think being able to take that risk, being able to think in an abundance mindset will hopefully set you up for some amount of success. <laughs> Fantastic, abundance, thank you. How about you, David? Um, so my word is uh, fun. I sort of had two different concepts I was trying to merge into one. Um, one is just a thing that I think I have done throughout my career that I think was really valuable was just work on things that you find fun because you're just gonna do better at them uh, than you would if it was just something that you don't find fun. Um, and there's another thing which is, uh, so there's an XKCD comic that says that uh, you know, whenever someone successful is up here telling you advice about what to do to, to get success, become successful, it should come with a disclaimer about survivorship bias. <laughs> uh, which I think is absolutely true. Like, I don't know if my strategy worked or was important. It was probably mostly luck. So I don't know anything about you know, what you want to do. Uh, and I think the important thing is to have fun and sort of work towards what will actually bring you joy, whether that's you know, working on video games or helping people in some particular way or gardening or whatever it is. Um, yeah, work on things that bring you joy and make you have fun because then you'll have more fun. <laughs> Great advice. Well, uh, David, Susan, and uh, to Jenny and all of the OpenAI team as well as everybody working on the documentary, huge thanks to you. Please join me in thanking them.